Dearest Crystal, I cannot express the excitement within me when I think that shortly we will meet face to face. Over the years, I've read your books and watched your videos, perused court documents, police records, and affidavits, yet I still feel confused about what happened between you, Todd, and the LSD laboratory so many years ago. I hope that when we are together, I will finally understand what transpired, and the truth will shine brightly as a crystal in the Kansas sky. Much love, Hamilton. Crystal Cole is one of the most unlikely figures in the psychedelic community. A goth stripper from Kansas whose introduction to the psychedelic underground came in February of 2000 when she fell deeply in love with a mysterious man named Todd who was the heir to a spring manufacturing fortune. She quit her job as a dancer and moved in with Todd at a decommissioned nuclear missile silo that served as his private pleasure dome of lysergic delights. Exactly what happened in that laboratory at the dawn of the new millennium is still a subject of heated debate. But it is known that Todd formed a partnership with Leonard Picard, an accomplished clandestine psychedelic chemist, and together they began to assemble what would have been the world's largest LSD lab. But before the lab could be put into full operation, it was destroyed by the DEA. After verifying that my intentions were pure, Crystal agreed to meet with me to discuss her involvement in the lab and take me on a guided tour of the subterranean LSD palace that she once called home. Last night we flew into Kansas City, and right now we're on our way to meet Crystal Cole. Outside of what she's written in her book, Lysergic, and her numerous YouTube videos, there's very little known about her. I have a lot of questions. I've wanted to meet her for a long time. Here we are. <laughs> hey, what's going on? I'm Hamilton. Nice to meet you. I was raised in a small Kansas town, which is comparable to being sucked into a spiritual black hole. I was surrounded by flat, bleak cornfields, farmed by similarly flat, bleak people. At a young age, my classmates labeled me as a nerd, causing me to never quite fit in. The first thing that comes to mind upon reflection is, thank God for being an outcast. My peers were the perfect example of white trash at its worst. The majority of them had already given birth to a couple children and dropped out of high school because of it. No aspirations existed in their minds beyond the next round of incestuous sex, six-pack of beer, and line of meth. Crystal is one of very few people surrounding the bust who is not currently incarcerated, and in the wake of extraordinary heartbreak, trials, and prison sentences, she used her life experience to inspire a variety of informational YouTube videos that have garnered much attention across the internet. So this is the green screen that I use to shoot all of the NeuroSoup videos. And so I come up with the name NeuroSoup because it's basically, uh, you know, the combination of neurology and then the soup, you know, we all have this soup of different neurotransmitters in our brains. And so drugs affect these neurotransmitters. And so that's kind of how I came up with the name NeuroSoup. Mm. You were saying that your most popular YouTube video is the shamanic colonic anal DMT video. Hi, some people have gotten onto the NeuroSoup forum and asked me about the time that I took DMT anally. And so today I want to describe that for you guys. There are some benefits to it. And I've only done it anally once because I guess the negative side effect to it while I'm talking about all the positives is that it burned really bad and it just kind of put me in this weird headspace. That was my most popular one until YouTube forced me to remove it because of its new community content guidelines. There's, you know, some other paintings and uh, more paintings and more fractals. <laughs> I kind of have them on the walls everywhere. <laughs> And of course, Grateful Dead Bears. <laughs> that one is the one that I put on my first edition of Lysergic book cover. 
it's my favorite one. And, uh, you know, the language around the side of it are things that I kind of saw when I was tripping, because alien-esque type languages. I don't know what you would call it. Can you talk about just the things you talked about at the beginning of Lysergic, how you got initially got involved in all of this? Yeah, um, well, I met Todd at a strip club. I worked there for um, about three months, and, uh, you know, he came in. Well, actually, one of his employees came in and saw me first, and then they went back, and they said, oh, there's this girl down there you should see kind of thing, you know, and then, so then he came in and met me. And shortly thereafter, you know, I was driving one of his Porsches and living, living out at his missile site. I asked Crystal to take me on a tour of the silo, which is now owned by a vintage tank enthusiast. It will be the first time Crystal has entered the silo since her romance with Todd. When Todd was seducing you, what kinds of things would he say? Oh boy, <laughs> I don't know. Um, I, at first he was very gentlemanly. You know, he wasn't like he was drugging me and taking advantage or anything. At first he was being the utmost gentleman to try to win my trust over. On the way, we passed the place Crystal and Todd first met. Club Orleans, one of Topeka's premier exotic dance establishments. This is the club that I met Todd, although it was a different name back then. They've kind of remodeled since then. I did kind of an interesting act, is I did a bondage act, and so I was, I really stood out for the Kansas crowd that's in there, you know. I would play death metal music and I had this like chain, you know, that I would hold around my neck <laughs> with a dog collar, I'd wrap it around the pole and stuff and I'd like whip myself on stage, you know, like. <laughs> I was really into goth back then because I, I really hated Kansas and I was just rebelling against everything that this whole place is about. And so he comes in there. He was sort of like the mad scientist. <laughs> so like, if you can imagine like a guy walking around with this big metal briefcase, you know, bald and his hair like the what hair's left sticking up everywhere. <laughs> like his clothes like rattered, tattered everywhere, you know. He would come in there and just sit with me and pay me like, you know, like lots and lots of money <laughs> just to hang out in the VIP room with him. And, and, you know, he would sit there for the whole day. And we did that for a couple of times. And then he's like, well, you know, why don't you just come out to, you know, where I live and stuff. And I was like, well, okay, I'll, I'll go out to your place with you. They have a policy where you're not supposed to leave with customers. You're not supposed to do that. And I never would have done that. But Todd was so persuasive. <laughs> and so I kind of gave in, you know, when I probably shouldn't have. If I wouldn't have met him, you know, I wouldn't have had all this horrible stuff happen. <laughs> but I also wouldn't have had all the cool stuff happen. So. They drove Porsches and had lots of money. And, you know, he bought me art money clothes and gave me money. And I didn't have to work at the strip club anymore. So I was like, hey, let's party. <laughs> you know, I didn't care. I'm kind of excited to see what it looks like in there. I think it's going to bring back a lot of memories. As we drew near the legendary missile silo, I tried to imagine Crystal arriving here with Todd for the very first time. You used to have to call in using the system right there, or you'd have an access code. Upon entering this silo, Crystal left the spiritual black hole of Kansas behind forever, and was introduced to Todd and Leonard's underground ring of chemists, dealers, and drug enforcement agents. These tunnels are really fun when you're tripping, <laughs> because they'll just start swirling on you, and you'll be like hanging on like, ah. <laughs> <laughs> and what was your experience with drugs before having met Gordon Todd Skinner? Virtually none. Uh, of course I did the normal drinking alcohol, smoking pot. Um, I tried meth twice and I did coke once, you know, but other than that I'd never even heard of MDMA. I, I didn't even know what it was. All I know is he's like, it'll make you feel good, just try it. <laughs> you'll like it, don't worry, you'll like it. <laughs> and boy did I. <laughs> Back then, I was on so many different substances. It was like living in an entheogenic monastery because I didn't have to work, I didn't have to worry about paying bills. I didn't have to do anything other than, you know, use psychedelics and, you know, pray to the God that we all share. <laughs> the whole situation was centered around tripping, so we just wanted to be comfortable. This here is the missile bay. About where the tanks are is where we had a platform set up with the stereo and we would have a couple of king size beds in here and a bunch of different couches, like leather couches and things. That way we could hang out and have plenty of places to sit down and lay down or wherever. Todd spent money with wild abandon, decorating the silo with stone statues, Persian carpets, cedar saunas, 
a marble bathroom with a tub large enough to accommodate a half dozen people, and a $120,000 stereo system, which he used to play both Sarah McLaughlin and Deep Forest at extremely high volumes. Yeah, we would all get in here and shower. There was lots of nudity, <laughs> if you can imagine that, you know. Lots of cute girls running around. <laughs> and the parties were, could get really wild. <laughs> One of the things they really liked to do was have IVs set up and have some like DMT or some 5-MeO in the IV bottle. And they would sit there and then they would like, you know, crank it up so they'd start tripping more and then they'd roll it down a little bit to kind of, you know, and so you could like, he would like, so, like surf in the DMT high, you know. <laughs> like, I would do a lot, but not that. <laughs> Todd seemed like the most spiritual person you would ever meet. I mean, you know, and when we would trip together, it was like, you know, I don't know. Tripping with him is different than any, tripping with anyone I've ever tripped with, you know. And we experienced things like telepathy together, and, you know, it, it, we experienced God, you know, if you want to label it that, you know, together. Crystal was exposed to a cornucopia of psychedelic substances, ranging from the more common chemicals like LSD, DMT, and MDMA, to such rarities as ALD-52, ergot wine, a variety of fluorinated AMT analogs, and a mysterious substance made by Leonard called diazidine. Unbeknownst to Crystal, Todd and Leonard began to argue, and Todd was slowly overcome by fear of both Leonard and an impending bust by the DEA. Todd was so secretive about everything. A couple of weeks before the bust happened, he gave me some MDMA and said, go in the bedroom and trip and leave me alone, don't come out here. So I was like pretty high and yet come out there and I'm like, what are you doing? I'm bored, you know? And so then I got to see all this stuff, you know, he had pictures of Leonard and you know, all of this stuff about Leonard, like this huge file on him, you know? Looking back on it, I should have known something was getting ready to come down when he had the, all that stuff out because then I could have said, Leonard, you gotta watch out. Wamigo residents say they were shocked when DEA agents arrived into town on November 6th looking for drug fugitives. In October 2000, Todd formally contacted the DEA and declared that he would like to turn in the world's largest LSD manufacturing conspiracy. Todd received total immunity for his involvement with the laboratory and walked away a free man, while Leonard was chased by the DEA, outrunning them on foot and hiding in a barn with his body covered with cold leaves to evade thermal cameras. The following day, Leonard was turned in by a farmer and eventually given two concurrent life sentences, without parole. Mego Police Department were brought in to assist in the manhunt which ended up being an 18-hour hunt for the individual. DEA agents believe the LSD lab is one of the largest in the world. After the bust, Crystal and Todd traveled across the country for three years with a small group of ravers and drug enthusiasts selling phosphorescent capsules of MDMA and living like psychedelic royalty in Seattle, Mendocino, Tucson, and Tulsa. Here's our California house. We had our own private beach down there. We would try to get the best we could everywhere. There were peacocks yeah. on the property. That... <laughs> yeah, yeah, there were peacocks on the property. You would think having peacocks would be cool, but it wasn't. Outside of our house, there was all these amanitas, and so we would go pick amanitas and stuff, and you can see us, we were identifying them and researching them. But some of these don't have Todd in them because we, he didn't let us take a lot of pictures. There towards the end, I think, you know, all the stress of the court case and everything, you know, the years of, of running and the years of all the problems, you know, which is really, you know, were piling in on him. And I think that, you know, he was just kind of going a little bit crazy. <laughs> Todd was very much escalating things. He was started, he started abusing me and like, you know, you know, literally, you know, physically abusing me. I was willing to look over some of the bad stuff that I started to see, you know, over the first couple of years, you know, because I'm like, oh, well, I know underneath all this, you know, it's just the stress, it's just temporary, you know, underneath all that, he's this beautiful spiritual person, you know, and he's doing all this for good reasons. And, you know, now looking back on it, no, he was just, you know, manipulating me. I was just, an, I was just a stupid girl, <laughs> you know. <laughs>
he always had a couple of other girlfriends and I always had boyfriends and we were each other's primary, you know, but I mean, but like we always had other people around. And so the boyfriend um, at the time, um, Brad, he was the first guy over the years that I dated that, uh, you know, that wanted, that said, look, this situation's no good. You need to get away from this. And so, and so I'm like, okay, well, the only way for us to get out of this is for us to go to the DEA and, you know, basically pull, you know, do what Todd did to Leonard to Todd, you know? And so we go to the DEA together and and we, you know, basically spill everything about Todd's local operation that he's got going there. They were already familiar with, the, you know, the Picard case and all that stuff. And so they knew who I was, you know, that I was Todd's girlfriend and all that. They had a case, you know, they had me, they had the boyfriend, and I told them where one of his labs was. So they had more than enough of a case and more than enough a reason to go after him. You know what they said to me? They're like, well, we'll give you a call. I'm like, okay. And so they had my phone number. So I go home and, and then conveniently, two days later, Todd called me up. Well, I know you went into the DEA. So you, you went into the DEA, you told them that he was dangerous, they took down all the information, didn't do anything at all to stop him, but told him that you had reported him and just infuriated him. Yes, and that is why he kidnapped me and Brad and did the things that he did to us. On the 4th of July, 2003, believing he was immune to legal prosecution, Todd lured Crystal and Brad to the Tulsa Doubletree Inn. Shortly after meeting, Todd offered Brad a communion wafer laced with an unknown psilocin analog. The next thing I know, you know, he's duct taped up and like, you know, they were injecting him with stuff. And, you know, you know, they were telling me, you know, if you don't, you know, obey everything we say, you know, we're going to give him something that's going to kill him. And, you know, we have to get information out of him. We have to know what he said. And As the drug took effect, Todd taped Brad up and spent one week subjecting him to psychedelic tortures of unfathomable depravity. I know that he was giving him stuff like, you know, barbiturates and, you know, things like Valium and stuff. But he was using psychedelics as a truth serum? Yeah, and he was using, and he was using psychedelics as well. He was giving him IV DMT. Any drug he had, he pretty much was giving it to him. You know, and after that, you know, after it was over, you know, I had to stay with Todd for a whole month. And I mean, he drugged me, he raped me, he sodomized me, he did horrible things to me. It's hard for me to talk about because I have PTSD now because of what he did, but it's, I mean, it, it's horrendous. I mean, to think that, you know, somebody would use psychedelics for the kinds of things he used them for. Todd fled to Burning Man, where he was arrested for MDMA distribution and ultimately tried for kidnapping and assault with a dangerous weapon. For these acts, Todd was sentenced to life in prison. Todd was so tall that he had to really watch out for those things, or he would, or he would hit his head on them. <laughs> He's still locked up, right? Yeah. He has life, so you don't have to worry about him coming back and haunting the place here. Yeah. Once you trip a lot, you can make any trip a pleasant experience, you know, uh, unless the person's literally standing above you and, you know, injecting you and, 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 and strangling you and threatening you and yelling at you and stuff. It, it, you can't, there's no way to make that good. <laughs> the last few years have been a difficult road for me to walk down, yet they have made me a much better person. I got so far out of touch with a normal person's reality. For years, I never worked a job, watched television, or even went a week without being around someone that was on an entheogen. I basically had to start life all over. I began watching the news to get up to speed on current events, got an apartment of my own, and started a business to support myself. I feel like, even after four years, I'm still working on reintegrating into society. In the spirit of actually doing something with what I've learned through entheogens, I founded a nonprofit website called neurosoup.com. My hope is that it will be a place for people to learn, share their beliefs about spirituality, entheogens, and themselves. Namaste. After everything that has transpired, Crystal still considers Todd the love of her life. We are all brothers in the family of humanity, and life is a cosmic giggle on the breath of the universe. Namaste.